Blog Talk Radio. Elkins on Stumble In Radio, and uh, we're going to be talking about Menken, Nock, and Garrett Garrett. Uh, as pre-request, or per-request, rather, uh, in Gelded, who is probably listening in from his condo in Tel Aviv right now, and uh, dressed up as a Croatian woman, no doubt. Uh, really, uh... I remember he posted a shot of his eyes once. He looked like Rutger Hauer, or Hayer, however you pronounce it, but uh, the uh, the eyes did at least. But uh, basically, uh, I don't doubt that he dresses up like an old Croatian woman before he uh, uses his sock puppets. I don't know about Bluto. I, I honestly don't know if he dresses up like a uh, cartoon figure before he... Uh, <clears throat> before he posts his Bluto. But anyway, let's get on to the topic. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about artistry, and about these mis- Midwestern novelists and artists, Albert J. Nock and Garrett Garrett. I'm going to start with Nock, because Nock is a very interesting figure, and I say that quite often in the in the case of these broadcasts. He's an interesting figure. What does that mean? You know, fundamentally, he's an interesting figure. Well, first of all, it means nothing more than uh, than that uh, I find him interesting personally. But uh, on the whole, they are of interest to us today for one particular reason, and I'm assuming this is why Engelded asked me to talk about uh, Garrett Garrett, because Garrett Garrett is an economic economic writer. Before the Austrian, so-called Austrian theory of the boom-bust cycle came along, well, as it was developing, rather, it, it, I won't attribute it to Garrett Garrett, but at the same time, in those early years, the 1920s, when Garrett Garrett is coming out with his uh, or rather than when Ludwig von Mises is coming up with his uh, his uh, socialism and these other um, books he wrote, Garrett Garrett is writing on the same subject in America, and Garrett Garrett had kind of specialized in bubbles and economic downturn. So he's in 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 relation to the American experience. So. It's not as if he has no relevance to our time. He has quite a bit of relevance, actually. And that's what's interesting about Garrett Garrett, uh, particularly. Nock also has relevance, but Nock was never an economist. But anyway, we're going to go talk about Garrett Garrett a little bit. Now, his name is pronounced Garrett Garrett. That's correct, as in uh, Attic, because that's what a Garrett is in Anglo-Saxon. But he was born Edward Peter Garrett. He was known as a journalist. And before I I, I go into his background, I'm going to talk about uh, where he was born and what year he was born, because both of those are significant uh, happenings. Uh, He was born in 1878 on the edge of the Gilded Age, and he was born in Illinois. And herein he has a similarity with uh, Albert J. Knopf, who was born in Ohio. And... uh, I'll, these are guys from the heartland, the so-called heartland, and uh, they're not—they're uh, not Easterners. They're not from New York City. They're not from California. They're from—they're from the heartland, and they have a unique perspective. They have a unique Midwestern perspective, as even though they spend their lives. Um, in the new centralized 
circles of influence, which is New York, uh, D.C., the eastern part of the country, uh, uh, or in other cases, uh, California. Now, um, they uh, they identify most strongly where, with where they came from, and that's what they're interested in. Perhaps even unconsciously, they're interested in their homeland, not in where they go to. Anyway, at the age of uh, only 38, he became executive editor of the New York Tribune, and he worked it for the New York Times, the Saturday Evening Post, and the Wall Street Journal. But it's interesting to, to say that he worked as a uh, as a financial writer because his whole viewpoint is economic, and yet he is also unlike so many uh, econo- economists today, a first-rate novelist. And uh, but basically, I'm going to go into that a little bit because that's very interesting, his his novels, the books he worked on. And uh, that's what he's best known for today because Justin Raimondo, and I'm, this is a brief digression, I promise, uh, Justin Raimondo, who is, of course, quite opposed to Ayn Rand as a anti-objectionist, objection of this rather uh has uh um asserted on numerous occasions that uh Ayn Rand ripped off a good piece of uh Garrett Garrett's novels and uh <clears throat> basically Basically, uh, what we have in front of us is uh, there are many similarities between uh, Garrett Garrett's novel, The Driver, and uh, also The Fountainhead, and uh, between The Driver and Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead. Uh, but uh, it's not really one of the... the uh, I'm going to go into that later. Basically, I want to start and talk about uh, Garrett Garrett's early works. And his first book was called "Where Money Grows," where the money grows, and anat- anatomy, anatomy. I'll work it out. I mean, this is what happens when you're a loner who doesn't talk for days and hardly says anything, and then you forget how to pronounce work anatomy. Anatomy, where where the money grows, and anatomy of the bubble, because Garrett Garrett spent his life chasing the bubble, and once again you go into the boom bust cycle, and uh, these artificial bubbles that are created in the stock markets and so on, and then and he identifies it first of all in a better way than I've ever seen an Austrian, a so-called Austrian economist. Identify it in base in that basically he says, uh, you know, these boom bust cycles are the result of what, and uh, then he answers that question. Uh, but before I deal with the answer, I'm going to note that the Austrian uh, you know, answer to the boom bust cycle seems to be the deregulation it basically seems to be total anarchy anarchy and that's a that's a deal where uh uh it's not really a viable solution which is why nobody talks about the austrian system of government uh basically if ron paul he really couldn't apply austrian economics to anything now, naturally, we need to deregulate and all this, but we have to deal with the fundamentals of why the boom-bust cycle exists. This is the fundamental problem. And Nock also addressed this, even though he wasn't an economist, because he was a sociologist. And economics are um, come under a field of sociology because they're done by human beings. Uh, they're not done by, uh, basically, uh, human beings are responsible for economics. Without people engaging in economic activity, there's no economics. And that's basically will sound a little too much like a classroom, so I'm going to avoid sounding like a school teacher and uh, 
continue with Garrett Garrett. Now, Garrett Garrett correctly identifies the uh, the problem on a numerous occasions, but one of his main deals, and you have to understand that his his argument is it's impossible for libertarians to embrace Garrett Garrett. He was an old rightist. Um, that's where my familiarity with him comes from. He, um, he, that he was part of the old right. He was a thorough isolationist in every sense of the word. That means he was opposed to free trade, and he was opposed to global trade. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's quite significant. And. Uh, Uh, that his answer to the problem was this isolationism. So I'm going to go into it a little later. But uh, he goes into... uh, Basically, I'm just going to... I can't obviously, in the time allotted, go into all of his books. So I'm going to... I'm going to highly recommend, first of all, uh, his uh, work on the Great Depression, The Bubble That Broke the World, and it was uh, written in 1932. And uh, once again, Garrett Garrett had been hunting bubbles or studying bubbles uh, quite some for quite some time before the Great Depression actually happened. Uh, the Blue Wound, his book, The Blue Wound, has to do with bubbles. So does Satan's Bushel. That's a novel, and it has to do with overproduction by farmers and uh, various other works as well, but I'm going to deal with this book because this is a very significant work, uh, The Bubble That Broke the World, and uh, he identifies the cause very simply on the first page. He doesn't, uh, it's a very short, to the point book, it's only 186 pages, it's very succinct, it's very interesting to read because it's devoid of, well, compare him to Thorstein Veblen. Just compare him to Thorstein Veblen. Let's and we'll say no more about it. Okay. Uh, also, it's uh, it's very interesting that he's still around. That the name means more to the average person than Thorstein Veblen. And mind you, that mean, name means nothing to most people. So, you know, uh, at least Garrett Garrett means as much, considering how divergent, what divergent figures they were. Anyway, uh, the Lord giveth increased, but man devised credit. All our, this is a delusion about credit. And uh, first, the idea that the panacea for debt is credit. Debt in the first order... Oh, I don't want to read too far. I'm going to try to keep it uh, simple. Second, a social and political doctrine now widely accepted, beginning with the premise that people are entitled to certain betterments of life. If they cannot immediately afford afford them, that is, if out of their own resources these betterments cannot be provided, nevertheless people are entitled to them, and credit must provide them. Unless it should sound unreasonable, the conclusion is annexed that if the standard of living be raised by credit, as of course it may be for a while, then people will be better creditors, better customers, better to live with, and and able at last to pay their debts willingly. Okay, now, that's basically an articulation of the Bush administration's position. And, to be fair, not merely the Bush uh, administration's uh, 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 position. It's always, it's been a natural American position. And, uh, for some reason, I can't find the third. And, uh, that may sound childish or uh, inept rather rather than childish inept is a better word of, but I can't find the third reason and uh, as a result uh, empty airspace is a terrible thing makes me nervous third. Okay, I found the third. The argument that prosperity is a product of credit, whereas from the beginning of economic thought, it has been supposed that prosperity was from the increase and exchange of wealth, and credit was its product. 
So, here we have Garrett Garrett, more relevant than ever uh, to our time. And once again, it's not likely that we will see a revival of him unless, and I can say that because Lou Rockwell, on LouRockwell.com, they've been saying that for years, but they really haven't internalized Garrett Garrett. They don't teach Garrett Garrett. And uh, that's a fundamental problem. I'm going to open chat. I don't know why, but uh, I think I will. Let's see. Open chat. Uh, if you've got any stupidity to say, you can listen in or chat and tell me what you think of my lousy performance. Anyway, Garrett Garrett, uh, he's not going to be revived by any any uh, libertarians anytime soon, because once again, Garrett Garrett is not a liberal. He's not a classical liberal, and he has there's elements of classical liberalism in his uh, viewpoints, but in his viewpoint, but he's not a classical liberal. He's not a capitalist. What is a capitalist? I don't know. Uh, somebody who believes in the rule of capital, who believes in the ideology of capital. It has nothing to do with the free market. I believe in free markets. I make that assertion as a hypothetical assertion. I believe in free markets because I believe uh, I should be able to go to the market and the market in town should be unpoliced and we should have peace and quiet to trade in peace without government interference. That's free market to me. A free market is a line of stalls and backed up by a large industry and this is the free market. Uh, in in the little village or in the big city, wherever it is, that's free. It has no interference from the state. Now, it's going to have cultural interference. That's that's uh, beyond, and it's going to have racial interference. So, a market can never be completely unshackled, but uh, it should be as free as possible, and certainly free of all uh, interference from the state. And I notice Kane is listening in, so. Uh, you know what, uh, uh, probably can't afford to call in and argue with me about the subject, and I'm really not here to argue about it with any young technocratic socialist, uh, which is, I'm certainly no classical liberal, but what I'm saying is that the market has every, uh, uh, what it, we have to define what freedom and markets are, basically. Anyway, Garrett Garrett. And that's basically all I'm going to talk about in this particular work, except these three salient points on which he bases his work are just as, you know, we can apply them perfectly. This book could be used today. And that's a interesting uh, in itself that this, that this book is out of print. It's available for free on the Mises Institute uh, on... Uh, Mises.org, Mises.org rather, not Mises. I always make that mistake. Uh, now, where, mon where the money grows and the anatomy of a the bubble is not available on Mises.org. And uh, I don't know where you can obtain that. I would certainly like to read it myself, but in any case, uh, moving along in our 40 minutes remaining, I'm basically going to try to devote 20 minutes of time to Garrett Garrett and 20 minutes of time to, what the hell am I saying? I don't know how I'm going to allow this time. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Garrett Garrett's uh, books, you know, rightists, uh, conservatives, so-called conservatives, even libertarians, they spend so much, let's talk about the Libertarian Party, spend thousands, millions, what am I saying, thousands, millions of dollars uh, on these parties and so on. Can't spend a few dollars to... Buy one of these uh, book binding machines, these new ones that uh, will turn out uh, a finished copy and uh, reprint. Uh, you know, there's not going to be a huge market, but let's say let's reprint uh, 200, 300 copies of uh, this book. And so it's no longer out of print. Uh, anyway, uh, you can see the rights priorities are totally skewed. Anyway, I'm going to talk about Garrett. Uh, the artist after a while. First, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, basically the fact that, uh, he, he, well, 
I might as well go right into the artist deal because uh, he was a novelist of some ability, and your average economist is a lousy novelist, and your average person is a lousy, lousy novelist. And uh, even so, and once again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Garrett Garrett's novels are eminently more readable than Ayn Rand's. And they're a lot deeper. There's more texture to them. Uh, Rand was a lot of things, but she was... Uh, being a woman was largely responsible for her best uh, bestsellers because she drew these pictures so starkly, and uh, the average person, the average uh, person could uh, identify with them. Now, it's a different matter for... Uh, Garrett Garrett uh, in the 1920s when he was writing his novel. And uh, Whitaker Chambers criticized Rand. He said, uh, basically, when Atlas Shrugged came out, nobody ever charged a beach for free markets or capitalism. And that's a worthwhile, uh, worthwhile uh, you know, riposte, as it were. But the thing about it is, is that... Uh, Rand was not a thorough isolationist. She had sympathies with the isolationist movement. Now, on the other hand, Garrett Garrett's main, one of the main thrusts of his existence was isolationism. And uh, I'm going to talk about that now. Uh, Garrett wrote several novels. The one that uh, a lot of people most uh, commonly believe is... Uh, is an was an influence on Ayn Rand uh, was a novel called uh, The Driver, and The Driver The Driver is a novel about uh, an entrepreneur, an individual figure, a captain of industry, a tycoon, and uh, this it's the kind of uh, individual that has disappeared from society. And uh, this is interesting because everybody thinks of Bill Gates. Well, Bill Gates is basically a nerd who got lucky. He's not a businessman who started with nothing. He comes from a good family. He's a a technocrat, basically, but he's not a businessman. He's not an entrepreneur in the original sense of the word. Compare Bill Gates to any of the entrepreneurs of the 19th century, and he comes up looking pretty sick looking pretty small in comparison. And once again, the last tycoon has probably, has pretty much died out because individual businessmen uh, were were, uh, very, were very conservative figures. They were upper bourgeoisie. They were as close to American. The original stock was as close to an American aristocracy as ever developed because they were merchant ventures. And I got into this before about Jim Bowie and so on. These were guys who got their hands dirty, who put themselves into positions of physical as well as financial danger, and they worked hard to achieve. They would put themselves based in a position of hazardousness that could only be overcome by hard work and by perseverance. And this is where the whole Horatio Alger streak comes in. The interesting thing about Horatio Alger is he's a Unitarian and uh, Unitarian homosexual, and Johnson asks, "Why are there no there are no right says there are no rightist artists?" Well, uh, you have this Horatio Alger, and he writes endless books about young boys, and basically because partially he's a pedophile. But once again, we're not going to engage in deconstructionism. We're not going to say his pedophilia was the most motivation of writing all these books, these um, one way or the other. He writes these dozens of books and he dies in utter poverty even though he's written many bestsellers and even his last his final works are bestsellers and uh, he writes these books about uh, these young boys that start out they are honest they're strong physically they're determined and they're going to succeed and they do succeed in the course of his works and Basically, he's not writing just fictional allegories here, uh, motivational literature. He's writing about the actual breed of men 
Anglo-Saxon men who arose, young men, out of the gutters in many cases to run their own companies and run their own railroads and other uh, associations. And basically the entrepreneur died out by this individual man, this tycoon died out by, uh, say, uh, 19... 1970s. Uh, Jacob Israel says uh, he's the only other person listening. Well, I figure in Geldit is going to uh, probably download. We'll probably get some downloads. It's not like I was planning to uh, do a broadcast on on Knock and Garrett Garrett for my own amusement. In Geldit specifically asked me to do a broadcast on uh knock and uh Garrett Garrett and basically I'm hoping uh some more folks will come in in the download. If they don't, I'll send it to Garrett Garrett's blog or whatever. Uh I did not say all Anglos are homos. Uh uh Jacob Israel, uh our one listener. I'm sure there are more listeners out there somewhere. If they're not there ought to be. Um, basically, I, I see it. I foresee a future time in which I round up people uh, and force them to listen to my broadcast. And possibly in the in the foreseeable future, I would see a, a case in which uh, basically would round up folks and put them in a warehouse and read my novels and poetry to them. And that would be a, a good uh, <laughs> a good punishment. I guess this guy's on cocaine. This guy's got to be on cocaine. Uh, Jacob Israel. Well, he's not a bad fellow for a Mazon sock puppet. But anyway, uh, as I said, the tycoon figure died out in the 1970s. And an interesting uh, deal, uh, sort of a heralding of their passing, was a sitcom uh, series done by Walter Brennan. And as everyone knows, Walter Brennan was extremely conservative. He was uh, he's well known as a master actor and a heartlander, as it were, too, as well. But he uh, he did this uh, he did this uh, show about a basically a retired tycoon, a, a entrepreneur who founded this corporation, and uh, he started with nothing. He's a you know he's a simple guy, simple man, but uh, uh, he he. Um, he runs it as an individual, and uh, basically, he's uh, the show plays it as um, he's in he's in a uh, he's in conflict with his the company bureaucrats, basically executives and the boards and so on. And one episode is actually called Horatio Alger is again Horatio Alger again, and the last is called Honest Man. And basically, it's this type of um, of this this type of uh sitcom that was really kind of middle received it did not have a great reception but it didn't have a bad one either and the reason uh uh it's not socialism it's not socialism at all Jakob. uh uh roundups have happened uh, in many different types of countries and I'm going to go into that after a while uh, trust me, my poetry is not that bad. It really isn't. And once again, uh, artists, and this goes back to the artist deal, but like I'm saying, I'm going to proceed here. Uh, with uh, with the case of um, of Nock, or Garrett Garrett, basically, I'm running out of time for this for the live part of the broadcast. I'll probably keep talking afterwards, but and you can get it in the downloads. But uh, uh, the dr- the driver's protagonist is named Henry Galt. Does that sound familiar? Henry Galt. And uh, the plot of the novel is very similar to Atlas Shrugged. And uh, it's very... In that uh, the guy runs a railroad, he starts with nothing, he is faced and it basically happens during the panic of 1893 and the guy runs a railroad he's faced with adversity 
and defeat um, by the force of the state, and yet he rises above that and helps to overcome the panic and the bubble after it bursts by uh, private individual means rather than status collectivist means. And uh, it ends with his death, but it's a happy death because he's succeeded. And uh, But it's interesting that this individual, whether it be his tycoon or Ayn Rand's, heroes and heroines of the steel industry and no longer exist because in capitalism capitalism is a collective entity it's a commonwealth it's based on boards and stockholders and groups of people and uh it's the very fact that these fluctuations and wall street they're not only based on cowardice i heard the stock was going to go down so i'm going to sh- i'm going to do this and that but i'm scared i'm going to have to take an action to avoid the the consequences of various uh down, stock market ups and downs whereas uh in uh in by contrast uh these these people it's not just cowardice on their parts they're just little people they're just little people in a big world they're like ants who are basically faced with this complex system that they don't understand that's more powerful than they are so uh it's an interesting uh it's an interesting uh you know to notice that and uh you know to imagine where does this boom bust cycle end we have no way of knowing right now anyway to move on as i said uh i'm going to go into satan's bushel a little bit satan's bushel is a novel about uh, overproduction and it's also a mo- novel about the Midwestern farmer. And uh, one of the most significant portions of it has to do with the fact that, which we don't often consider, uh, contrast Bolshevists to the Nazis. Uh, what the hell? Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to uh, to uh, note that uh, Jacob Israel who is our one listener right now, high on cocaine, and he's quite an interesting fellow, you know, for a guy who is uh, basically some sort of uh, sociopathic um, his own sock puppet. He's a very well-read, probably the best poster we have in this year, uh, have had in this year besides Jackboot and uh, this Barley Roundtree the third. So uh, basically, he's saying uh, the Nazi Party was formed in in uh, reaction to Bolshevism. Well, yes, obviously. Though Ernest Nolte uh, does uh, does consider fascism a unique uh, form of reaction, as it was not really really well thought of by existing rightist groups, and it really cannot be considered a rightist movement at all but nonetheless i'm not going to criticize it obviously anyway moving on to uh moving on to satan's bushel and once again socialism anti-civilization you don't believe me read some pruton anyway uh this is uh one of uh, there are a number of great speeches in his work because in the works of the time a lot of people complain about the length of uh of the speeches in Ayn Rand's books and absolutely uh except what I didn't say uh see this guy is clearly is clearly uh uh tweaking pretty hard because I didn't offer him anything except a couple of count compliments maybe that's what he's accepting anyway uh basically uh these dic- these speeches that appear in Rand's novel are basically the best indication that she was uh, taking from an earlier style of literature in which the characters spoke. They just didn't uh, kind of chat with one another. They gave speeches, because in the old days, people could actually do that impromptu, and uh, they could do it quite well, and uh, very ordinary people could do it, and they would talk. People would just not talk in sentences. They would say what they had to say at the length they had to say it in. So I'm going to briefly consider and recommend that you read from Satan's uh, Bushel, which is a reference to, uh, uh, once again, to overproduction in these farming. Uh, read page uh, 
I think it's page 40, and uh, he, uh, this guy, Absalom Weaver, Weaver, is listening to a sales pitch for farmers to join a marketing cooperative, and uh, they ask him what he thinks about it. And uh, this is what the, this is, I'm going to briefly read from this. He had not yet begun to speak, but he was peering about in the grass, stooping here and there to pluck a bit of vegetation. He walked as far as the fence for a bramble leaf. Returning, he snapped a twig from the elm above his head and faced them. This towering elm, he began with an admiring look at the tree, was once a tiny thing. A sheep might have eaten it in one bite. Every living thing around it was hostile and injurious, and it survived. It grew. It took its profit. It became tall and powerful beyond the reach of its enemies. What preserved it? Cooperative marketing? What gave it power? A law from Congress? What gave it fullness? The golden rule? On what was its strength founded? A fraternal spirit? You know better. Your instincts tell you no. It saved itself. It found its own greatness. How? By fighting. How did you know that plants fight? If you, on, if you could only see the deadly, ceaseless warfare among plants, this lovely landscape would terrify you. It would make you think man struggles pain. And he goes on for that, like that for three or four paragraphs, um, concluding, The farmer is like a plant. He cannot run. He is rooted. He shall live or die on the spot. But there is no plant like a farmer. There are nobles, ruffians, drudges, drones, harlots, speculators, bankers, thieves, and scallywags, all these among plants, but no idiot saying, how much will you give, and what will you take? Until you fight as the elm tr fights, take as the elm takes, think as the elm takes, you will never be powerful and cannot be wise. And uh, that's, a very, uh, that's a very unique uh, viewpoint, perspective, because... It's not anything you'd expect to hear from a classical liberal, and of course, Rain or Rand. Hold on, we got a we got a caller on the line. Hello, who do we have on the line? Well, you have Pastor Linstead, but he's trying to go ahead and make this stupid chat thing to work, and it ain't working for me. Well, it it can run a bit slow at nights, Pastor. Oh well. I'll uh, I'll go ahead and try to uh, you know make it make it go ahead and run and. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead. And, I'm gonna go ahead and shut shut it off and try to go ahead and get on chat somehow. Uh, you know maybe I'll go ahead and call in the last couple of minutes. Uh, you seem to be pretty well talking about uh, a number of economists and. I don't know, uh, you, you were saying that uh, a lot of right wings didn't agree with uh, fascism. Well, Lothar Stoddard, uh, he sort of liked fascism. He went ahead and wrote a book, book about it, or he wrote a book about uh, racial realities in Europe, and he was talking about how Mussolini, with fascism, had pretty well changed Italy because the uh, people were getting tired of what they called the transformo, and they were getting so tired of the... Uh, one one group, the socialists, going ahead and coming to power and then screwing them. And then the uh, Christian Party coming to power and then screwing them. They got tired of politicians. And they were pretty happy when Mussolini went ahead and took over. And uh, lots of stuff, I would say, would definitely be a rightist. And uh, he sort of talked uh, that fascism was actually figuring out what actually worked. And it was really not so much a program, but rather a pretty sort of, you know, racial nationalism among the uh, uh, people involved. And they were they were pretty much going ahead and taking over from all these politicians because Italy had the same problem with politicians that we do in the United States today and that Italy, Italy does now. So that every single politician goes ahead and promises something and then all he does is just go ahead and loot the treasury. And uh, from my guy, Mussolini, when he established fascism, was uh, pretty popular among the uh, ordinary people. And even uh, the king, Vittorio Emmanuel or something like that, pretty well fell into line behind, behind Mussolini. 
until, uh, of course, Mussolini ended up losing the Second World War for Italy. So, uh, well, no, I think I you're, say, you're you're correct. I'm not bashing fascism tonight. Uh, what I'm saying is, well, basically, I wasn't dealing with it, but you're correct in in saying that fascism kind of draws from a number of different sources. Yeah, I mean, like National Socialism. There's a lot of people say, well, it's all socialism. Well, uh, I've been stationed over in Germany, and generally the people there, they're not Americans. They don't want to be Americans. And as they look at it, uh, what's good for the overall society is what should be, is what should be paramount. And your average German, he, uh, he doesn't, uh, I mean, they have their Social Democrat Party. And uh, it, it's supposedly left-wing, but the thing about it is, in many cases, it isn't really left-wing. It's just pretty well pretty well socialism for the masses. And, you know, the average, the average German, he, do, he goes ahead and he, he does sort of like, you know, pretty well a, you know, a safety net to go ahead and take care of Germans. It ain't too crazy about all these Turkish... Uh, guest workers who's living around, but they got to where a couple can go ahead and have a subsidized apartment where they can go ahead and live, and they can go ahead and have German babies. And Well, at least that was the way it was nearly 30 years ago, and I'm sure that, you know, since the German birth rate has declined, even so, that it might very well be the same as well. But they're having, you know, they're having problems with more and more, more Muslims coming in and all that sort of thing, but your average your average uh, European doesn't have anything wrong with socialism per se. Uh, what they what they have what they have a problem with is essentially the the national socialist as practiced by Germany. But there's a lot of there's a lot of people who are coming in saying, "Hey, we don't need all these muds coming in." So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and let you. I'm going to go ahead and let you go back on. I'm going to go ahead and hang up and. Uh, and try to go ahead and get on the chat if it's all possible. But I don't see okay. I don't even see where it's possible. You have a good one. Bye bye. Okay, I appreciate your input, Pastor. Uh, I'm gonna continue uh talking uh basically as uh Pastor Lindstedt says, uh Europeans don't have any problem with socialism at all and socialism is a given for every form of economic liberalism in uh in Europe and when you talk about Europe right European rightists I've gone to uh Pruton and uh, a few others Sorrel and uh, these are the, the rightists uh economists in Europe these are the, the uh economists in uh basically classical liberalism is is um completely frowned upon in Europe it does not exist uh fundamentally anyway moving on i'm i've got 15 minutes left so i'm obviously going to talk about knock mostly in the download section but garrett garrett is less known than knock if that's possible and uh so i'm glad we were able to focus mostly on garrett garrett this evening uh, anyway, I'm going to move along, deal with Satan's bushel some more. Uh, very rare, very rare uh, book, and once again, uh, it's very hard to find. It was re- re- er- good God, my voice is really screwed up. This is what happens when, as I've said before, your brain and your tongue become disconnected, or the skids that grease the connections between your brain and your tongue are not greased. Did that make sense? <laughs> anyway, I'm not stoned, I promise. I'm not stoned. Uh, it ran as a serial in the Country Gentleman magazine. And uh, once again, uh, compare this to Ayn Rand's prose, uh, writing by railway through the wheat fields on a very warm May evening is an exquisite experience if you give yourself to it. All sounds are muted. Those that are naturally harsh, harsh become pleasing and satiny. I suppose this is from the fact that the grassy ocean absorbs them, somewhat as snow does. 
The shriek of the locomotive at road crossings is like an echo. The wheels on the rails sound like a lathe tool cutting soft iron. You would think the train was stealing its way on tiptoe for fear of waking something. And all the time, the air is vibrant and musical with the rhythm of phantom castanets playing just over and under the lowest pitch audible to the human ear. You rather feel than hear it, and that aromatic pungency of the growing wheat. The smell of the sea, so fresh and clean, is a fabricated, purified smell. This is a living, untainted essence, originally sweet, distillation of sunlight trapped in the dew. And, uh, you know, what can you say? That is, uh, not only can I imagine those smells, I have been there and I have, you know, uh, gone through that, and that's what makes it interesting. Uh, uh, I walked on the railroad track to Arkansas this past Saturday, and uh, I don't know how far that jaunt was, but it was a real nice experience because basically on both sides is farmland. And if you've never walked through a wheat field or ridden through a wheat field on horseback, and uh, it's it's an extraordinary experience. But Garrett Garrett, for this very reason, is not popular among modern libertarians because he stands for industry, he stands for farmers, he stands for the entrepreneur in the old sense, and it's pretty hard to reconcile that with the, with the uh, speculator in the stock market uh, trader of today. There's there's very little, as Whitaker Chambers notes, uh, about that's noble or uh, superior about them. They're just scared little men in a system that they don't understand. And uh, for that reason, uh, I believe Garrett Garrett's works are in many ways superior to Rand's in that they create heroes that are more uh, to be admired and more... We, c- we consider them to be history because Rand's figures, they want to, uh, they want to make a movie out of Atlas Shrugged. And uh, are they going to make it in the 50s? Because are they going to make it in the 30s? Or are they going to make it in the present day? It's kind of up to the the uh, adapters of the film of the uh, book for the film because Rand never really sets them in any particular day or any particular era. They're there. They exist um, as an allegor- allegory rather than uh, Garrett, Garrett's uh, characters and plots and novels, which are rooted in a particular place in a particular time and we can't uh we can't say they exist today but we we can't say there is anything like them today but we can say there could be like them uh, there could be something like them again and this is the essence of anarcho futurism i guess because civilization comes and goes as i've i've talked about uh uh davila in uh i'm not talking about uh I'm not talking about the fountainhead that's the fountainhead you're thinking of, uh, Dinsdale Piranha. Uh, and it wasn't bad either. I, I definitely like the fountainhead, but uh, uh, they've never made out the shrug. Anyway, uh, as I say, Garrett, Garrett's novels have this texture of the past that could be the texture of the future because they're so uniquely linked to civilization. And uh, it's, I don't think uh, Rand, Rand plagiarized anything from Garrett Garrett, but she, she certainly uh, was influenced by it. Uh, and uh, moving on, um, there are many... Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to have time to talk about the blue wound because what I'm going to basically do is sign off when I have to sign off, and then I'm going to continue talking, so continue a list. Uh, continue to listen. You know, uh, as far as uh, I'm once again addressing Dinsdale Piranha, plenty of Zolot Bucks to be made in the remake, and that's absolutely true. And what's the uh, deal is we would, uh, I would like to remake it myself uh, because I'm an aspiring filmmaker, and uh, it would probably have to be done on a much smaller scale. And I'm not crazy about modernism though there is a lot to be said for this 
whole modernist thing if you read uh Jonathan Bowden's stuff about modernism and Bill uh Bill Hopkins and so on. These kind of old reference there to the angry young man. Anyhow, I'm gonna move on, stop digressing. Uh about 1900 began the flowering of that alien graft upon our tree of sapiens, called intellectual. He was the precocious product. Sorry, he was the precious product of our free academic world, a social theorist who know who knew more than anybody else about everything and all about nothing except how to subvert the traditions and invert the laws. Now that would really rub a libertarian the wrong way, and. Uh, Basically, well, it's it's I've I've been known to <laughs> claim the title of intellectual myself, and you know, Zed and I often joke back and forth about it. But uh, intellectualism has pretty much died out in our culture, and this is an example of how conservatism comes about. Uh, we, we tend to uh, we tend to try to conserve the wrong things because uh, a lot of conservatives will decry the death of intellect the intellectual whereas we see Garrett Garrett heralding their rise and criticizing their rise and uh because nobody's saying very few people have the level of education Garrett Garrett did before uh and will certainly not have Albert J. Nock before long before the uh the rise of these uh, these 20th century intellectuals. Anyway, going to move on. I think this is from the Blue Wound. This is going to be my next to last quotation. Actually, I got two more. Basically, uh, I'm going to talk about Garrett Garrett right up to the end of the broadcast. And once again, I I must stress that you should keep listening because I'm going to or download it as soon as possible because I'm going to talk about knock largely in the in the uh, uh, latter part of the show. So, Nock, uh, Garrett Garrett, rather, Apex. He's talking about ape, uh, Japan in the Blue Wound. And this is one of his futuristic works in which he predicts World War II in 1920. And he calls, and he says that World War II will happen in, the 19, in 1950 and that America will uh, probably lose. But basically... You know, all of his prognostications are not correct, but there's an element of correctness in his work. Anyway, uh, because he gets uh, he gets a lot of it right, he just has the dates messed up. But a lot of what he predicted actually happened. It just didn't happen when he predicted it would happen. Anyway, uh, he uh, he talks about uh, isolationism as a trade policy. What is an isolationistic trade policy? Well, read the Blue Wound, but first of all, I'm going to summarize it in page 89 of the Blue Wound. The point never to be lost sight of was that the people who made their own things so far as they could, instead of buying them from foreigners, were always more prosperous than those who sold the raw produce of their fields and mines and bought manufactured goods from others. And, of course, that's exactly what um, we do today. The Japanese for a long time were completely isolated from us and from the western world they isolated themselves and they got along fine uh they embraced technology of a sort but they still isolated themselves as far as manners and morals went and they, and while they were also at simultaneously engaging in this rigorous uh war against their own traditions kind of all at once and I don't want to go into that but I think that's interesting that summary of of uh you know in which he extols Japan as this economic uh paradigm and uh, it's interesting to compare that to to Mishima's view of Japan as that's his ideal Japan as well this isolated Japan isolated from the western world anyway uh this last novel I'm pretty sure this is the blue wound too uh where am I? Blue Wound Driver, Satan's Blood. I think it's the Blue Wound. I should know this, but I'm basically cutting and pasting here, so bear with me. Blue Wound, where am I? Which page? Okay. 
page 75 and 76. And uh, basically, as she, in these novels, these novels are di- a dialogue between the, the protagonist, the hero of the book, which who is a wise man called Merid, and the uh, the author, as it were. So he says, uh, Merid says, meanwhile, finding more drudgery to do it to do than it had the patience or time to perform for itself. Your country imported tame slaves from all over the world in vast numbers to make railroads, build highways, dig in the mines, tend the furnaces, and gut the forests, calling it immigration. Immigrants are not slaves, however, I said. They are admitted to citizenship and enjoy full political rights. They are free to come and go, said Merid. Therefore, you do not call them slaves. But they call themselves slaves, wage slaves. Their part is drudgery. Upon it, you have, raised, you have reared an edifice of wealth unique. It is insecure. Those whose toil it consumes in a reckless manner have eyes to see it and hearts wherewith to be envious and revengeful. They pity themselves as oppressed. They complain, then demand, and at length revolt. Then the terrifying discovery is made that their toil, though it has been despised, is vital. If the sultry masses who dig coal and mine iron, suddenly refuse to be docile hewers and bringers, what will happen? You say they will, in that case, destroy themselves. That is nothing. People are continually destroying themselves, and yet they go on forever. But civilization is rare and fragile. The power to destroy lies in the hands of those whose labor it was, it wastes contemptuously, and by whom it is hated accordingly. And this is a very vivid prophecy because we are no longer living in a moment of civilization. And it's also uh, a very anti-libertarian. I don't know why I keep harping on that because as far as immigration goes, it is another form of slavery. This is why we've had immigrants say we're a nation of immigrants. Well, this is not fundamentally true. We're a nation of pioneers. And we might as well say a nation of militia when we say a nation of pioneers, because what does pioneer mean? It means this, uh, these guys who rode around in wagons following the artillery to dig trenches. And basically what it came to mean over time was basically these armed farmers. Uh, a pioneer is just the American word for vortrekker, essentially. Anyway, uh, Garrett Garrett, once again, was very prescient in a lot of his thought. And uh, his best-known essay that I first came in contact with, first put me in contact with him, was his essay, The Revolution Was. And uh, basically, I highly recommend The Revolution Was, and my broadcast is about to come to end, this first part. And I recommend all of Garrett Garrett's works. I'm sure by this time you've been burning up the Wikipedia entries and trying to find out about him, and uh, or at least I hope you have. Uh, and I recommend er- anything you can find out about Garrett Garrett, and anything you can read about him is worth reading. Because his works are eminently readable, as I said, uh, and quite interesting. And... Uh, uh, the People's Pottage. Uh, the revolution was as part of the People's Pottage, and the People's Pottage is what we ha- has always been with us, even though he's been forgotten. And it's a significant, uh, sig- significant, significant uh, work. Uh, Dinsdale Piranha says, "We I call what we live in technological barbarism." Yes, I've actually used that term before, and it's certainly applicable. And uh, at that point with uh, not many seconds remaining. I'll say uh, this is Breckenridge Elkins signing off the first part of the broadcast. Be sure to download some more in Gelded. I hope you're listening. And we are no longer streaming, but we are online. We are continuing with the broadcast. And I'm dealing with Garrett Garrett's The Revolution Was. And uh, Garrett writes in this broadcast, there are those who think they're holding the past against the revolution that may be coming up the road, but they are grazing in the wrong direction. The revolution is behind them. It went by in the night of the Depression, singing songs to freedom. 
and uh, he continues later in this. Basi- well, let me go into that a bit because uh, the what does he mean? He means that the revolution happened, the socialistic takeover, or the fascistic takeover, or what the hell ever we can call it, happens under the American flag with the backing of the Constitution, and it happens legitimately. This taking a, the seizure of the American people's freedom, the slow death of liberty, civilization, and so forth, happens uh, under the Amer- under the guise of freedom once again, and it happens with all the trappings of a freedom or of a libertarian uh, manner, and it happens in the name of humanitarianism, it happens in the name of man, it happens in the name of American values of at mom, God, baseball, and apple pie, which I'm sure all of which I'm sure FDR believed in. And uh, anyway, Garrett Garrett writes on page uh, 5 and 6, I guess is toward the introduction of the people's pottage, a time came when only the only people who had ever been free to, began to ask, what is freedom? Who wrote its articles, the strong or the weak? Was it an absolute good? Since it was clear to reason that freedom must be conditioned as by self-discipline, individual responsibility, and many necessary laws of restraint. And since there is never in the world an absolute good, why should people not be free to say that they would have less freedom in order to have some other good? What other good? Security. What else? Stability. And beyond that? And beyond that, the sympathies of we, all men as brothers, instead of the willful I, as if each man were a sovereign, self-regarding individual, well, there is a freedom. Itself, doubt itself must be where there is freedom. Doubt itself must be free. You shall not be forbidden to interrogate the faith of your fathers. Better that, indeed, than to take it entirely for granted. So long as doubts such as these were wildish pebbles in the petulant waves of, that gnaw ceaselessly at any foundation, perhaps only because it is a foundation, no great damage was done. But when they began to be massed as a creed, then they became sharp cutting tools, wickedly set in the jaws of the flood. That was the work of a disaffected intellectual cult, mysteriously rising in the academic world, and from the same source came the violent winds of Marxian propaganda that raised the waves higher and made them angry. Even so, the damage to the foundations might have been much slower and not beyond simple repair if it had not happened that in 1932, abundant intellectual revolutionaries hiding behind the conservative planks of the Democratic Party seized control of the government. After that, it was the voice of the government saying, to the people, there has there had been too much freedom. Well, I have mixed feelings in retrospect about... Uh, about uh, Garrett Garrett's approach, because we pace it, we place a huge amount of <sighs> emphasis on this cabal that takes over the government. I'm going to go into that a bit with uh, with uh, <laughs> with uh, Knox more, but. Once again, I can't recommend Garrett Garrett too much. I'm not going to spend too much time going over his statements uh, except to read his work and doubt the cabal thing because so many liberals, as I'm about to point out, were Freemasons. And while Garrett was not a liberal, I wouldn't be surprised if he were a Freemason. Now, there were no ma- there was no mass... Uh, conspiracy i don't believe in masonic conspiracies and i'm not recommending that you believe in masonic conspiracies what i'm saying is it's hard from garrett garrett's perspective as a possible freemason to really understand how this cabal arises mysteriously supposedly anyway i don't want to go into the origins too much i'm going to go to albert j knock and i know knock a lot better than i know than I know Garrett Garrett. And Knox has been along, 
around longer, for one thing. Nock is an outright anar- anarchist. He's not even a. He's not even pretending to be a. He's not even pretending to be a, a conservative or a libertarian or whatever. Garrett Garrett never really goes into ideology, and he's just saying. Uh, well, he basically says right in front of us that little brat wind that keeps saying, but you are absurd, you Americans, like the rich fat boy from the big house who is tolerated while he spends his money at the drugstore and then gets ch- and then gets chased home with mud on his clothes. He is bewildered and hurt, yet he wants so much to be liked that he does it again the next day. But this is a parable, and you are probably too stupid to get it. But if you don't believe it, if you do, you won't believe it, and so no harm will be done. You will come again tomorrow. And uh, so uh, Garrett Garrett is a little more plain than, uh, and that's from uh, Ex America, which you got to read right now. Go and read it this minute. Uh, Ex America, or I'll ban you from Stumble In. <laughs> Ex America, uh, once again, Knock is different than uh, Garrett Garrett. He's been a, he has a different background. Uh he he's from Ohio and he's a few years uh younger I think than Garrett Garrett. So he's born but he's a man he's a he's a different sort of man. He's not an economist. This goes we're gonna go into the culture and once again I talked talked about why there are no right wing artists. And uh well, we have Garrett as an example of a perfect, perfectly good artist, and we have Albert J. Nock, who was a man of letters. And this was a this was a fundamental uh, job. At one of the times we didn't talk about intellectuals; we talk about men of letters because, and these were not letters like Ph.D. These were men who were capable of writing, and who understood history and philosophy, and more importantly, they read Latin and Greek, and uh, this this is what went into their letters. They were actually letters we're talking about, as in the Greek alphabet. Anyway, Nock was a was very uh, was very reticent about his personal life, but he was born in Ohio. In I said Ohio, but he was actually born in Pennsylvania. And uh, I got that wrong. I'm going through my notes here. 1873. He's actually somewhat older than Garrett. Garrett, and uh, he comes from humble origins. His father was a steel worker and a priest, a Episcopal priest. And uh, he uh, he was homeschooled in his early years. And uh, he was homeschooled until he was 14, actually. And he learned Latin and Greek. And uh, then he went to St. Stephen's College uh, for four years. Um, uh, He began when he was 14, actually, and he played baseball, which is interesting because it indicates that he wasn't a nerd. And uh, once again, this current crop of libertarians is truly pitiful uh, because I don't think there's a... You know, Patrick Friedman tries, but... uh, at the heart of the matter, he's always going to be a nerd. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Nock was a liberal more than Garrett Garrett. He was a true classical liberal. And a genuine classical liberal, rather. And uh, he was much more in the mainstream of as a sociologist because he started off writing for the nation and the nation is an interesting magazine because they say it was at the time according to wikipedia is a time supportive of liberal capitalism well what is liberal capitalism and why is the nation supporting it it's a good question huh well the nation is supporting liberal capitalism only because it breaks down the final economic barriers of europe of traditionalist europe and once that's done, we'll go to socialism, 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 liberalism. And once we're done with social liberalism, which kind of factors out the generation of the slightly upper class, we'll go to just social democracy, which is run by Walter Lippmann's conditioners, media conditioners. So 
Knock joins joins uh, quite late the staff of the nation quite late in life because he he's, he was a Episcopal priest for a number of years and then he was a journalist then he left his family and uh, uh, went to work for the nation and uh, he became quite influential as a journalist he was uh, he was a uh, very taken with William Jennings Bryan. I don't know why. It's kind of one of those strange deals where because William Jennings Bryan is uh, basically one of those enigmas, basically. He doesn't... Uh, I'm not going to go too far into that, but uh, mainly I would assume it was because of Knox's position on World War one, which Brian opposed, and Nock actually went, worked for the State Department, and went on an ambassadorial, a private assignment for Brian, and it was probably some anti-war deal. Now, Nock is probably came to fame with his uh, deal with the Georgist movement. He was a Georgist, and as a, believed in... Uh, he believed in uh, Henry George's economics, and he was not in any sense a, a Austrian, though I suppose today he would be sympathetic to the Austrians. And uh, Henry George was an interesting figure, and uh, Nock basically believed that the leftists who who took over, the liberals who took over after his death were basically socialists, but then George wasn't a socialist. Now, the whole land tax idea which George proposed was basically like the fair tax deal today, and it was actually tried in some areas, I believe, in Europe. And uh, to this day, I think James Bowery uh, has some... Has some uh, uh, He's a proponent of the land tax, of a, of a land tax, and I'm a, I'm assuming it's something similar to what George had in mind. Marx didn't like George because he thought George was a gradualist, and I don't really know anything about George in the sense that I don't know if he was a Freemason. I don't know what his, I, I really don't know about his background, what his real economics were, as it were. But his George, this Georgism. Uh, was basically uh, very interesting to Nock, who was, he kept an open mind as far as the left uh, liberal uh, anarchistic movement uh, went. He was a, he was a devotee of Franz Oppenheimer um, in his work, the, the, the State, which is basically my English translation of Der Stadt, uh, Uh, Oppenheimer's thesis is that the pursuit of human ends can be divided into two forms, the productive or economic means and the parasitic, parasitic political means. And I really, this is an example of liberal homogene, hom homogeneity, which they try to uh, simplify everything. So I don't really go into Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was certainly pretty far to the left, and he was essentially a socialist, now, well, you can say what you will for Ivan Illich, but you can't say a whole lot of for uh, for Oppenheimer anyway. Nock was editor of the Free Man, and the Free Man was a single tax uh, magazine when it began, and uh, it was full of intellectual writing. All those who were someone wrote wrote for. Uh, wrote for anyone who was someone wrote for the free man Charles Baird Bertrand Russell Thomas Mann I wonder what Thomas Mann had to say Lincoln Steffens the notice the noted Stalin apologist Thorstein Veblen the noticed economist William Henry Chamberlain Suzanne Le Follet and we have to remember that uh, Robert Le Follet was a republican so called re progressive uh started out as a republican anyway uh, let's see. And uh, as I said, 
uh, uh, he uh, he edited this journal for a number of years, and. Uh, He was very influential. The twenties was the twenties was Knox decade. Pardon me while I lit a cigarette. You didn't hear the the lighter snap, did you? Anyway, the free man was basically never really turned to profit supposedly, and uh, Knox being a good friend of uh, Menken, uh, uh, he basically went solo, as it were, and uh, a handful of individuals began to fund his work, basically allowing him to pers uh, pursue a variety of product projects, as Wikipedia puts it. Now, that's an interesting deal in itself, because today, if, you f if somebody funds you, you are at their mercy, essentially. We have a much, in those days, they were living on the edges of a civilization in which a gentleman would pay uh, an individual, an artist, to write, and they weren't, uh, they weren't trying to get a profit out of it. Everything has to be a profit from a certain point of view, and this is certainly the case with art today. And uh, basically, uh, the product of uh, Knox's ability to live on these donations was a book called Mr. Jefferson, and it's very interesting to note the similarities between Knox Jefferson and uh, disparities also between Knox Jefferson and Ezra Pound's Jefferson. And uh, Jefferson being a fascinating figure in himself, you know, one could claim with these varying influences, uh, Knox claims he's a fascist, uh, what am I saying? Knock claims he's a fascist. Pound claims he's a fascist. Knock claims he's a libertarian. Well, but his most significant work is 1932, On the Disadvantages of Being Educated and Other Essays and Theory of Education in the United States. And Knock attacks modern education as founded by John Dewey. And Knock is in good company because he's he's there with Richard Weaver and he's there with the twelve Southerners, and they're all attacking. He's, they're all attacking this system of education, and I'm not going to go into what that entails. But Knock realizes that he's living on the edge of civilization, the very edge. And everything is going to go downhill afterwards. After, after, uh, after the 1950s. Basically, this nostalgia for the 1950s is hugely misplaced, first of all. Uh, but secondly, it's, uh, it's, uh, entirely it's entirely uh mis it's entirely just totally out there it's a tv it's an example of a tv history because we have all this uh remnants of the 1950s when hollywood was doing its finest and its finest wasn't that great when from a archaeofuturist point of view anyway knock wrote a lot and he, he became more anarchistic as the ages as the time passed, and he also became more pessimistic as the time passed. And uh, William F. Buckley Sr. was one of the uh, individuals who funded Knock, and uh, that's how he, became, he gained an influence over uh, William F. Buckley Jr. And uh, for many years, uh, William F. Buckley recommended uh, memoirs of a Superfluous Man, and this is kind of how Knox saw himself at this twilight of civilization, because like Wyndham Lewis, who incidentally uh, embraced free market economics in his last years, 
after seeing what Labour had done to Britain. Uh, Nock realizes that culture is collapsing. Western arts are disintegrating. Dada, as Evola practices it, is sort of a wake-up call. It's not saying that uh, what is the point of Dada in the 1920s, that far away. What is it? Why are we considering this particular form of art? And uh, aside from everyone else besides Evola and or Evola, art is dead, so quit. Uh, uh, we continue to pretend that art is still alive, whereas it's wonderful to say that it's dead because we're not trying to revive a corpse anymore. We're going to work from a perspective that it is dead and we have to either recreate a new... Well, I'm I'm loath to say recreate because what we get from that is a Frankenstein monster. So I'm not going to really say recreate. Anyway, Nock was not, in any sense of the word, a conservative. Just because he was he was uh, he was uh, he lamented all these declines of civilization and these declines of mankind like uh, Ralph Adams Kramer who was also uh who was also a uh individual uh conservative or rather a rightist he wrote a, a essay called uh why we do not behave like human beings what are human beings supposed to behave like well once again this is the humanist aspect and this is why they lost as far as the culture goes because we go to the trouble of trying to denote uh diagnose the problem with humanistic uh, antidotes. And Adams Cram writes, the ancient doctrine of progressive evolution, which became dominant during the last half of the century, of the 19th century, was, I suggest, I suggest next to the religious and philosophical dogmas of Dr. Calvin and the political and social doctrines of M. Rousseau, the most calamitous happening of the last millennium. In union with Protestantism and democracy, and apparently justified in its works by the amazing technological civilization fostered by coal, iron, and steam and electricity, it is responsible for the present state of society, from which there is no escape, it would seem, except through comprehensive calamity. And, uh, you know, it's one of the most significant statements from this modernist, he's, he's known as a modernist, is that uh, apparently justified, it, this, the, all this is apparently justified by the amazing technological civilization. What if technology and this progressive evolution have nothing in common except, uh, except that they existed at the same time? So, uh, you know, it's, it's something to think about, isn't it? Why does this pr um, progressive uh, ev uh, evolution continue to exist also. Anyway, like I say, Nock is not, in any sense of the word, uh, conservative. He writes, uh, one of his best essays is called A Little Conservative, A Little Conserva Slash Tiv. And uh, it's, a, it's a real good article, and if you can find it, uh, it's very well, It's uh, he basically really gives it to both parties. And he he does it in such a way that you wonder why our magazines, and Buckley especially, would bother to continue. You, you, when I say you wonder, you gain a new sense of conspiracy. You gain a new sense of understanding of why a conspiracy exists today, and why because Buckley, Bill Buckley, having read all all of Nock, presumably, having read what Nock wrote, not the anarchist stuff, let's just deal with uh, what Nock wrote in his political writings. It's It seems ridiculous for Buckley to spend the next 60 years of his life playing party politics and writing analysis, ana uh, uh, making analysis 
God in heaven, what am I doing with these words? I am really butchering the English language tonight. He's, his analysis of the uh, the uh, uh, the political situation as though it matters, Be- and he has Knox's whole volume of work behind um, previous to him, which is totally cynical about the party system, is totally cynical about democracy, and what is he going to do? He's going to continue right on with the with the uh, situation that's always incurred uh, before, continue facilitating that situation as though it, it's actually existing. So it's for this reason that uh, it's hard to take uh, Buckley seriously, basically. Uh, and uh, to continue on, Nock writes a number of good essays on the subject of the state, because you have FDR in in the 30s talking about the total state, and uh, of course Nock wrote Our Enemy, the State, and I'm not going to go into his philosophy or into his anarchism, and The Criminal State, also a good work, and this was published in 1939 in the American Mercury. And uh, besides his anarchism, as I keep repeating, he was not some stick in the mud. Uh, From 1912, we have uh, his views on eugenics, some disconcerting discoveries of Carl Pearson by Albert J. Nock, A New Science and Its Findings. Well, uh... This is uh, this is quite an extraordinary work, uh, and uh, it's done. And who is it done by? Is it done by uh, a liberal of some sort? Well, in a sense, it is. Nock is a liberal, but he's also very, he's also very uh, up to date and very interested in something that liberals are very opposed to, even in those days to a certain extent, and that is uh, eugenics. And uh, Nock, more than Garrett, Garrett has some problem with the Jews. Nock is not exactly an anti-Semite. He just doesn't like Jews. He doesn't like the Jewish influence. He believes that the inflationary monetary policy in the 20s that was done by the Republicans, by the way, was responsible for the Great Depression. He doesn't like Jews in Jewish bankers, he doesn't like Jewish speculators, and he writes a whole book about the Jews, and uh, or, is it a whole book or is it essays? Um, not really in front of me right now, but he's written substantially about the Jews, and uh, and uh, he, he's best known as an essayist, because his essays He's a craftsman in that regard. Some people build furniture, other people build essays. And they build them to be eminently readable. And Nock is eminently readable. His his uh, works are on par with Mencken. Mencken had a bit more of a biting sense of humor than Nock. But they were both artists. And Mencken in particular, Mencken was an extraordinary figure at the time. And... Uh, Basically, uh, I can't remember what book it was. Garrett Garrett wrote several books, and basically it was a running uh, deal of rightist artists in the 20th century to write about how these groups of liberal and socialistic intellectuals take over the government and take over a one world or one state, federal state. And, of course, that's all based on the British Fabians, and it actually happened, you know. But the deal is, today... People think that it's possible for a right rightist movement to emulate that and uh, gain power by stealth. And this notion comes from liberals within the right, and uh, they can be the heart. And basically, it's embraced because a lot of rightists don't know any better. But Burnham documents how liberal Republicans merge with the counter-revolutionary right in reaction to socialism in the 20th century. 
And uh, today we have the remnants of those liberal Republicans, and they basically run the show as far as the right movement is. And they urge the young intellectuals, the young thinkers, the young rightists of this caliber to use these Gramassian means to gain control of the state, which is impossible. But first of all, we're against Leviathan. We don't want to ride Leviathan. We want to basically get rid of it. Uh, basically, Garrett, Garrett, and Nock have very different uh, theories of history. Uh, Nock has this... Uh, Nock is completely anti-war, basically, and uh, he's an isolationist in that sense. As a total, as a philosophical anarchist, he uh, he uh, is opposed to uh, all forms of government, essentially, which means that uh, he can't really be an isolationist in the sense of uh, of uh, Garrett Garrett. Now, Knox's essays on the Jews. He, he wrote two, uh, two of them called The Jewish Problem in America, and it was published in the well-known, I think, monthly, well, obviously monthly, Atlantic Monthly. And uh, they're quite interesting in themselves because uh, uh, at the time, it was 1941, and you could write this, there was that degree of freedom even in a state that was run by Jews because 1941, America, the American government was run by Jews at that point in time. I'm not saying it's run today by Jews, and I'm not saying it was run in 1952 by Jews, but in 1941, particularly the Roosevelt administration was run almost entirely by Jews. In any case, uh, Mencken said, uh, I don't... Uh, dis- Somebody asked me if I disliked Jews. I replied that it was certainly not true that I dislike Jews because they, I don't like them because they're Jews, but because they're folks, and I don't like folks. And that's a very difficult statement to unravel, and it, it's a testament to uh, Knox's ability as a man of letters. So. I'm not going to really unravel it, actually. (laughs) I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, Nock, once again, as a... a, uh, He died of leukemia when he was only in his 60s, but he had a great deal of influence, and uh, he basically views the state much like... uh, He basically views the state... Much like, uh, why do I say that? I said that already. Much like his uh, Oppenheimer. But uh, I have my own theory of civilization, actually. It's the family theory, which which is not original, of course, which dominant clans gain control over one another. We talk about how behind every great man is a good woman or something like that. I think the Victorian saying goes that way, but... Really, behind every great man is the clan and the name. If we go with the mid, uh, with uh, Charlemagne, Caesar, uh, the Borgias, any number of leaders came from recognized families, and Napoleon was the last of these leaders, and his family was more of a liability than an aid. But to make the family dysfunctional is to render it unfit for use. And this is what happened in, by uh, 1800, because the family is meant to be used. It's not meant to exist for its own existence. And, uh, you know, we have a... I've heard a number of critiques against... Uh, well, you take that uh, neocon pencil neck RM at Terrell, and, or you take... Take uh, Ann Coulter in CNN. She told CNN uh, she was a right wing Mencken. Well, I don't. I'm not going to even try to make sense of that statement uh, about uh, the most powerful private citizen in the United States. Is how the New York Times described Mencken. And 
uh, Nock kind of exists in Mencken's shadow, which is wrong, because Ann Coulter is certainly, though it has protected him from being heard of by Ann Coulter, and you probably don't, if you're a historical figure, you probably don't want to be heard of by Ann Coulter, otherwise she'll write a book like that McCarthy book, which is kind of unnecessary considering how many books have been written defending Senator McCarthy already. Anyway, you know, uh, Mencken calls Hitler an, Austri- an Austrian William Jennings Bryan, which is actually says quite a lot more about Bryan than it does Hitler. That comparison really lends itself to Bryan more than Hitler. I said I was going to talk a little bit to close off about uh, why there are no more Knox and Garretts and Mencken's and uh, why I'm basically real tired of, uh, and my mouth dry, and I can't really get up at this time to uh, to uh, refresh myself because uh, I'm sitting here with a shotgun on my knees, and that's another story I don't want to go into now. Uh, but these are two I, I've left out a lot about Nock. I've left out an examination of a lot of his works, um, as I did with Garrett Garrett. Because Knox, Knox largely laments this this uh, death of uh, the rightist artist. As as I've mentioned, Windham Lewis did, and Mishima was a kind of last the breed, last of the breed. And... Uh, Basically, Nock, Mencken, these were the last of the Tory school. They may have been liberals in some sense, but they, uh, Garrett Garrett, they were the Tory school to impact American politics. After them came this American middle class with its middle class aspirations in economics, and they dominated the right for over... 70 years, and right now we're seeing a resurgence of this aristocratic uh, urge seen by Richard Spencer in the alt-right, which does not overly impress me because Richard Spencer has never done anything in his life, and he could probably kick my ass, uh, but there are a lot of people who've never used, uh, done martial arts, who are not martial arts practitioners, who could kick my ass too, so it's neither here nor there. He's really is I have a little bone to pick against his uh, beautiful Russian girlfriend again as well, but I'm not going to go there either tonight. Uh, basically, after these these uh, these figures like uh, Garrett Garrett and Mencken and others, we find a scattering of, of great artists after 1960s. We have Auburn Waugh. Auburn Waugh is an accident because he's the son of Evelyn Waugh. We have Jean Rospail. Jean Rospail is an adventurer. He's a he's a traveler in the old sense of the word, and he's a novelist. And he wrote Camp of Saints, which is of course famous. And uh, Jean Rospail is not your ordinary bourgeoisie writist. Jean Rospail went uh, on several major research uh, expeditions, and uh, he was he won the grand prize of whatever by the Ac- French Academy for some novel. He wrote significantly about the West Indies and traveling in South America and uh, Alaska. He crossed Alaska in those early days because they only put the road, in, the highways in in the late 70s, early 80s. So. Raspail was a traveler in his own right, and he 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 had contact with any number of cultures, and uh, he was not writing from a sheltered perspective. He had a very uh, 
interesting perspective on that as a whole. So, with that said, my throat is just too damn dry to continue. I'm going to talk about Raspail's book, his leading work, some other night. But I'm going to kind of connect him with with uh, with Nock in that form because he's he's uh, his work is forgotten largely. Uh, social contract pre- uh, press has disappeared, but he talks his uh, his last word on the subject is kind of called the fatherland portrayed by the republic, and that says just about all in that just title because he, what he's saying is that. The French Republic has betrayed the patrie, the actual nation, the soil, the people of the soil, the people which arise from the soil and go back to the soil. And this is, once again, what uh, Nock and Garrett Garrett were fundamentally interested in. They were interested in Americans from the heartland. And they were interested in what was good for them and what worked for them and who they were. They understood the character of the American from the heartland and that they were best governed least and with this uh this sort of background this is what they chose to defend this is what they took up the cudgels for and uh i'm going to talk more about right wing artistry future i don't like to use the word right wing because it's a left wing term and uh in any case uh this is Breckenridge Elkins signing off at last